funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. You're listening to Programme 3 of the five-part series, There Is Life After Addiction. Throughout our modern Ireland, many people and groups are doing Trojan work to help people recover from addiction. Whether it be drugs or drink or whatever, and live addiction-free lives. One such group is the Peter McFerry Trust. To explain the Trust's roots and work, here's Francis Doherty, Head of Communications in the Peter McFerry Trust. Peter McFerry Trust started off in the mid-70s when Father McFerry moved into the Summer Hill and started working in youth projects that were set up at the time by the Jesuit community. Um, from that, he became aware of the issue of, of rough sleeping, particularly among young people and homelessness in general. And there was one specific case that was the trigger for uh, Peter setting up a charity and formalising his work. And there was a nine-year-old boy that he came across that was sleeping rough in Summerhill, uh, who was sort of sporadically accessing the, the youth services that Peter was providing, sort of the youth club, the activities that they were putting on in the evenings and stuff. And through Peter's sort of engagement with Paddy, the nine-year-old boy, Peter then went on to open an under-18s homeless hostel in the inner city. And from there, the organisation has evolved to what it is today, which is uh, still very much working with the younger group within homelessness. So we provide children's services and we provide services to young adults as well. And a core component of the Peter McVerry Trust's services to young adults is drug treatment. Francis Doherty. The drug treatment services are critical and they've been part of the charity for a long, long time now. And again, it comes back to who we work with, who we specialise in supporting. So the participant group predominantly would have a drug misuse issue, either current or past, that is impacting on them today. So we provide a couple of stabilisation services in Dublin and we also provide a residential community detox which is based out in North County Dublin. So the stabilisation service operates in two ways. We have a early relapse prevention and a stabilisation programme. So the stabilisation is the first element where we often see people polydrug use. Uh, so they're mixing their benzos or cocaine, alcohol. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to get them to come on to a harm reduction approach which is basically choose a drug of choice stabilize your life on that single drug you have a bit more dignity you're a bit more coherent you're a bit more functioning and uh, from that then we're moving you towards a point where you're going to be reducing your usage you're coming down and then you're going into early relapse prevention so you're not going to go back to the chaotic drug use that you were using before ultimately we would like to see people then go through to detox programs so our detox which is based out on a five acre site in north county dublin is a portuguese horticultural model that we brought over and um, it initially started off as a methadone detox because the 10 or 11,000 people that are on methadone in the long term. Um, so we operated the methadone detox, but now in recent years we've operated now a cannabis cessation program for young people, and we do an alcohol detox now as well. So those two new elements are responding directly to what we see coming through the door and what's in our services. So the cannabis cessation program came about because a lot of young people were having psychotic episodes, there was mental health issues because of the potency of the stuff that they were using, and then there was also associated issues around drug death, death threats, impact on the wider family, if you like, sort of the parents' home and siblings' homes and stuff like that. So we began operating the cannabis cessation program on the same site, same residential type model. And then more recently, we've operated the alcohol detox. And that's predominantly aimed at people, again, within our services. Many of the older men now in our services would have a an alcoholic sort of addiction that is probably the sole barrier now to them sort of you know growing older maintaining that apartment that they're in so what we've done is uh, operated a bespoke alcohol detox in this in the service for those older guys and it's really targeting you know key people within our services that we see that as a problem that they need to overcome in order to take the next step so we do that and then the stabilization team will also do in reach into some of the hostels so we go into the hostels we arrange sort of clinics we do one-to-ones we do counseling and stuff like that and we're trying to get people to come back then to the actual stabilization center itself for the the group sessions the one-to-ones and the formal process so 
it is a core piece of our work given who we work with it's very important to the organization and we're sort of trying to push the agenda that it's a health issue around drugs rather than a criminal justice issue and so our approach is very much a harm reduction approach uh, part of my job and, and the job of the organisation is very much we try and break down the judgment and the stereotyping of individuals and the labels that give rise to judgment. So we have addicts, junkies, scumbags, all this type of language that's thrown about the place. But, you know, it's a person. It's a person that has arrived at that situation. We, the public at large, see people at their most vulnerable on the streets. So we see people sleeping rough. We pe- see people uh, maybe openly using on the streets. And they are people that are at their most vulnerable and are very public in that vulnerability. And, you know, for the rest of society, we don't ever present that vulnerable in public. We do so when we're vulnerable. We tend to be at home in a space that we're comfortable doing it. So, you know, we're making judgments on people that are in a very vulnerable situation that have a lot of challenges in their lives. People that are homeless, they are still people, you know. There's still people in in the inside and outside, you know what I mean? Just because they probably have a bit of muck on them and they take drugs, they still have a soul, they're still human beings, you know what I mean? But the people who walk down the street and say, look at that scumbag or look at that crackhead or... Look at that, good for nothing. Don't see that behind that is a beautiful person. Beautiful person. Addiction counsellor Barry Butler. Here's recovered drug addict James Maughan. When I was in my addiction, I ended up begging in Dublin there, Fibsborough area. And that was a rock bottom point for me. You'd see your friends going past, your family members as well, and you'd try and hide your face. People would look at you, look at you, and maybe see you as a piece of dirt. And you sometimes you could be sitting there. I'm not, not not looking for simply now, but you could be sitting there all day trying to get the price of a bag of gear up. And that, that's what that's what I was doing, you know, just sitting there and it, you 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 lose your soul. You really do. It's a horrible feeling, even now to think back that. Uh, you could do with that. I always sympathise with people now that I see do, if I saw them doing that because that was me, you know. That was I was there and I know what it's like. And it takes a brave, brave thing. It's easier to go out and well, rob someone and take their money, but it takes a brave any individual to sit down and actually to put a cup out in front of them and beg. And I also asked Francis Doherty of the Peter McBurry Trust had he any advice to parents of adolescent children who might be listening in. I think it's very important to talk and part of the talking process is listening as well. In other words, keep the communication channels open. Yeah, and you know, we are a service provider that at the end of the day our staff are engaging on a one-to-one basis with everybody in our services and it's a process of talking, listening, uh, it can be more formal in terms of assessments, one-to-one meetings and stuff like that. But it's a constant flow of communication and understanding to make sure that, you know, if we as an organisation can provide somebody the right support, then we will put them in the direction and put them in front of the person that can provide the right support. And it's about not fearing reaching out for help at any stage. And um, I think it's keep the communication open, keep engaging and try and, you know, direct people to where they you think they might need directing to and encourage them and be positive. And I think carry maybe less of the judgment and just more of the what do they need and how can I support that. And have you any advice to anyone, Francis, who's listening and who's probably suffering from addiction or knows someone who's caught up in the agony of addiction? Yeah, I think we are fortunate in that there are a number of organisations that are very good at providing support services. So Peter McFerry Trust obviously works with people that are in the large homeless or part of the homeless population. But there are others that will support you even uh, beyond, like if you're not in homelessness, but you just have a drug issue. So I would encourage people to, you know, if they're not engaging, 
to seek out and engage with many of the agencies that are out there and to also to seek the support of your local GP and your local medical sort of centers and stuff like that. So once you get into the process and you get sort of engaging with the staff, the staff on the front line are are fantastic individuals. They are fully committed to you and to your needs. And I think that's what people need in in the space that they're in. And uh, the first step is to reach out and ask for help. And staying with the work of the Peter McVary Trust, one person who was greatly helped by the Trust in successfully finding recovery from his addiction to drugs and gambling after he finished treatment in the Rutland Centre was Paddy from Dublin. It was in 2013 I came out of treatment at the time and uh, I'd, I'd nowhere to live. And while I was in treatment I got in touch with the McVary Trust and in order to reside in one of their houses, a, a clean house, what we'd call it, you'd have to go into treatment and come directly from treatment and straight into the house. So, uh, yeah, lucky enough, I was uh, I was given the green light and I was admitted to a house. At the time, I'd done me five weeks in treatment and I came out and it was a bungalow and it entailed six lads. That was all our treatment ac- across the country. And... Uh, yeah, we resided there for, you know, the next six months, you know. That was my base and my building blocks to where I am today. At first, when I when I met up in the house, I was very welcomed, which was lovely, you know. And there was a, a, a weekly uh, meeting in the house that involved with the Peter McFerry staff. You know, uh, you were asked to give your lines twice a week. Uh, they encouraged you to get out and about in town to either, you know, get yourself involved in uh, drug rehabilitation programs, i.e. the likes of Solche, you know, uh, Cassid, there's plenty of them in town, Kilmoyan, uh, the ACRG. So I picked uh, Solche at the time in my one. But uh, no, I just thought the supports were very good and in terms of the housing and things like that, they look and they give you support in terms of getting housed after the six months were up. And that's exactly what happened for me. You know, brilliant. In other words, try and get new life patterns, break away from the old ones, and yeah. stick with the winners. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, the good thing about it was, you know, when you come out of treatment, you you want to be around like-minded people, and and that's what it involved with me. I was I was in a clean house with, with guys that was going out during the week. We go to meetings, you know. We get involved in our recovery. Uh, you know, it was it was just the whole circle is just it's full of support, really, which is which is critical, you know, to, to actually get well. Paddy, here you are on the other side of the journey, so to speak, the yeah. journey from dark to light now. What's the best thing about recovery from addiction for yourself? Oh, there's so many different things, you know. Me get around the smiling today, you know. That's a big thing. My family are happy, you know. They're not worried. I'm not causing misery to people. Uh, my independence is back. It's a major thing. Uh, I'm back working, you know, uh, financially. I'm, I'm getting there. It's just for when you when you mention darkness into the light, it's a good definition because that's exactly what it is, you know. Me based in my addiction, I'd be going around penniless, you know. As soon as people see me, they want to turn the opposite way because they know I'd always be after something. So, you know, it always involves self-seeking. I want it, I want it, I want it. But today is different. I can give back. Like this morning, I'm at the being up, glossing the doors upstairs. The whole hall is nearly painted. I'm not expecting anything back for it, you know. It's nice to be able to give back today. And, yeah, that's what that's what my recovery gives me today. It's to be to be that good person that I, I, I know I am. Yeah, and it's just, it's it's basically down to, you know, me coming out of treatment back then and getting involved with the Peter McFerry Trust and, you know, that was the building blocks to where I am today. It gave me back respect, you know. I found out who I was as a, as a person and that's very important for you to do in recovery, you know. So, yeah, I'm very thankful to the Peter McFerry Trust. Very, very thankful. They learned me how to live again. Any advice, Paddy, to maybe somebody who's in active addiction at the mm. moment? Yeah, well, come here, listen, there's always, there's always, always hope, you know. Anybody that is affected with addiction can always come over and get a better life. I'm a firm believer in that, I really am. 
just to have that bit of hope there's plenty of places within the country that give out support and just you know to realize that it's not all about you anymore you know it's it's it, you know it's there's other people involved uh, because your thinking can be very centered around your behaviors but yeah there's a there's a big life out there and you you, you do feel when you're in addiction that the cloud will never go away you know, you feel you're underneath that cloud and, you know, you, you get wrapped up in self-pity and all that kind of carry on. But it's only when you, oh yeah, you go into treatment, you know, your, your thinking starts to clear up, you know, you start to look after yourself a bit better. You, you know, you're able to look yourself in the mirror. You, you begin to actually like yourself again. And that is the vital part of actually giving yourself that chance in order to, to move forward, you know, definitely. And one person who took a chance and moved forward in his life was James Mon. He began his journey of recovery from drug addiction in Wheatfield Prison, with much help from the staff there. In Wheatfield, I managed to get clean and stay clean. So I looked at my life in there and uh, looked at all the reasons. You have a lot of time to look at yourself in there. Different to treatments, you have so much time on your hands and you know, you're locked up at 7 o'clock in the evening time and... You kind of do well on yourself, what brought me here, and the root of my problem was always the addiction. That was the issue. It was all the offences I committed were all to feed. It wasn't to live a nice lifestyle. It was just to feed a bag of heroin here, a bag of heroin there. And I said I needed help with this. I don't. I didn't. I was frightened about going back out. I was wanted to stay on longer in Wheatfield, and I felt safer in there. I was one way: you have your bed, you have your food, you have your clothes washed. You don't have to worry about you paying your bills, you know. And I was actually enjoying it in there. It's a strange thing to say, you know. But I'd worked with a lot of staff in there, and the staff kind of uh, said to me, they put me in contact with Peter McFerry, and they said to me, "Look, we'll try and get you a place there when you finish." So. I'd finished my sentence a while ago when I came here. And Peter McVerry and others eventually helped James to get a place on the drug recovery programme in Coomware Rehabilitation Centre in Athai, County Kildare. Now, because our last two programmes in this series focused on the work of Coomware, the remainder of this programme will instead throw light on some of the work done by the Irish Prison Services in helping people to find recovery from addiction. Here is James Maughan to further discuss his experiences in Wheatfield Prison. Wheatfield Prison, that was a turning point for me. The services that were available up there uh, were unbelievable. There was, uh, I, I, after a couple of weeks I was put onto a drug-free unit there and that was a big step until I was offered the chance to have a one-to-one counselling with a drug counsellor. Now, you don't have to, I mean, I applied for the, all the services are there, but you have to go and say, I need them. They can't be coming around forcing people to do it. And if you want the services, they are there. I mean, it's prison service. You know, they do, they, I found, anyway, with me, my experience, being in and out, they do a good job, a fantastic job to get very little respect for it sometimes. sometimes you know, the, the, I was treated with good respect there. And I they all helped me in any way they could and I always have that to say I said I was very sad leaving there I know it's a strange thing to say but I, they, they supported me and they've helped me in any way I could they were, and they wanted to see the best for me they don't want to see me back there you know uh, the, the, the services are available in Wheelsville there's drug counselling there's edu- full education system up there there's there are teachers there they'll sit down they'll talk to you and they'll help you with your needs there's various workshops up there and I really found that that was a turning point for me you know you're given a chance there to have a look at your life uh, unfortunately not, not a lot of people are ready to change their life some pr- people are in there they're career criminals and they won't change and that's you know, their choice but other people are in there they're not ready to maybe look at their own issues as to why they've ended up there and that's I found at that point I just wanted to change and I approached staff to and they pointed me in the right direction and they continued to do so until I left and I would praise for them all up there And another person who successfully recovered in prison from his addiction to drugs was Dermot, from the heart of Dublin's inner city. He was greatly helped in his recovery by Father Charlie of Whitefire Street Church in Dublin, where I conducted my interview with Dermot. Whitefire Street Church. I just come down here on uh, 
to visit my family on neutral venues. He, Father Charlie, he set up a programme there, there uh, for prisoners that they come and see their families awaiting the prison. So they, they now went so degraded, the families. So I uh, got to know them down there. But, but um, I mainly met them coming from Mount Joy. You know, I was up there for four years. Four years locked up there for possession and supplying of heroin and cocaine. But after about six months, I got, uh, um, just got, had enough of it. Just looking around her all the time, had enough of it. And I uh, said, uh, enough is enough. Got myself clean, clean three and a half years. You know, I'm still on a, uh, still fighting with, it, still fighting with addiction, but just taking it day by day. But um, put it this way, at the moment, so I only got released two weeks ago. After saving four years, I, was, I got 12 years, I got six years suspended. But uh, out of six years, I did four, just four years over. But I'm trying to get myself into the air big time now. I have an interview there in um, June, May, for uh, the College of Art and Design. I'm trying to set up my own business, uh, um, doing kids' notaries and all, no cartoons, to you know, figures on walls, apartment paints, and getting into the beardy card section of it as well. Do you know, because it's, it's just no life out here in drugs no more. Yeah, I'd end up with your name in a headstone, or end up being a statistic. And one thing which Dermot found very helpful in prison was art. Only for the art, the painting. I self-taught myself in prison. Sat down, had one or two teachers gave me a voice there to help me through only for them. So I'm saying I was interested and put the effort into me. So I ended up just sitting down every day myself, four or five hours a day. And before I knew I just self-taught and kept going and on and on. And to be honest with you, before I knew it, the drugs, I wasn't thinking about drugs. I was thinking about... I said, geez, this day has gone past, I didn't need drugs today or whatever. I was just, I was in, I was that bad when I went in force, he thought I had six weeks to live. Taught me liver was going to give way, but I knew I was in the last chance of living, but since then it's really not to change my life around now. I, um, I'm working at the moment, the pr prison got me released to work on an air programme. I thought I was seeing a bit of potential there. I was representing uh, Mount Joy in exhibitions around the country. I did a... Uh, Kamainham Jail, uh, National Hunt Museum, did Longford, uh, Sligo, it's, it's not a county, and I think it's like Tampa Bar, it's uh, Fisbret, it's, it's in so many different exhibitions. Uh, the president got the president posing with me, gave me a bit of confidence posing with me, paintings, and, and then I started getting people that was interested approaching me, other prisoners' families and all, and seeing me part for and asking me what I do with them, you know, paints for them and all. So, at the time, I hadn't got too many. I had me one or two of my family that used to come up and visit me. So apart from that, that would just keep me going, me, me few quid. But got to love it. So the scene was not much interest in them. Put a program in place. There's this a uh, program, a uh, noise sound program. Now they have uh, a. If you have most of your sense, so you have to for a few months, but you got to walk there. I walk there three days a week where I'm doing art all the time. So it's not like I'm getting out digging fields, something that I'm not interested in, where I say, ah, oh, here I'm sick of this, you know. So I'm really not getting into it. So I'm hopefully there for, I'm there for a course for 20 weeks, um, get my portfolio ready for college, the rest of my portfolio. So uh, my interview I have in May for the College of Art and Design. I'm hoping now this is me, if I can get myself in here, this is me main goal. But July I'm hoping to start up a business um, how to try to get the fun, uh, funding off the, uh, the, the welfare as well to help you start your own business where they're doing uh, like crashes, uh, nurseries, you know, like uh, cartoons to be painted around with bedrooms and that, you know. In a way, the prison, same one or two officers out of prison, it's not been helping me get on the course, you know, the push when the senior main the effort, the interest. That, and uh, where he ended up in Mount Joy was a drug free unit. So you had to prove yourself every week being drug free, you know. You had to get drug tested and all, you know. So you had to prove yourself for a couple of years before he gave it a chance. But now I'm there and just ready to go. There's so much I want to do, so much to, I should have done years ago. So, well, my daughter's at the age now, I want to make them proud. Where before they all said the mentality, they were kids, they didn't understand, you know, they wouldn't have known if I was drinking or I was on drugs, you know. I, I just put them through too much misery, please coming through the door, morning, noon, and night, you know, it was, it was just, it was, uh, I wasn't living, I was existing. And uh, I was only, it was only, I uh, used to have to go down to clinics and this and that, and it was only more or less a statistic. That's all it was. I wasn't a part of society, contributing to nothing. And that's all it would have been a statistic. And I ended up with it would have been a statistic on a, 
in a morgue. That's what would end up happening if I hadn't gotten a chance to change my life around now. And even friends that I have still in prison, they're all pushing for me to do well, you know. They dare not to change themselves around the prison. They're waiting on the same type of opportunities to get courses like I am. There's one of the teachers up there as well, uh, Eleanor and Max. They used to do the art up there. And any supplies, they weren't meant to any supplies they used to give me from me, uh, what, um, canvases, paint brushes, me paints, which would usually cost a few quids, you know, and, and get me out, out photographs from my portfolio, and they set me up and all, they can help me get this course, not only for them, I would have been lost now. So I think if you have a, somebody there willing to help you, and you want to help, you know, I think it's, you can be given a bash, you, can, you can't change, you know. And I also asked Dermot who most inspired him in his journey of recovery. To be honest with you, um, my sister had read me when my mother died when I was seven. It was a couple of months before my communion. My sister, she was only 17. So gave she up. was basically a little mum. Yeah, little she mother. was only 17, so she gave up her whole life to read me and had her own daughter then about 10, 15 years later. But it's harder I don't want to let down. She lost her husband last year. And she... Um, no matter what I did, when I was a drug dealer or whatever, she always told me, she said, damn it, look, you will change, stick it out, you know. She believed in me all the time. It's really her believing in me. I think you have somebody believing in you there all the time. And I love her that much, her and her daughter and my kids. Uh, I just don't want to let them down. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't care. I, just, I wouldn't be in this position that I'm in now. I would have been still at doing what I was doing, you know. But I think if you have somebody there that believes in you, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's, they won't let anybody say you're any wrong about you, even though you know that you're in the wrong sometimes. You get through it. You just need somebody there to be a rock sometimes, you know. And somebody that you, you know, you idolise, don't want to let down, you know. But uh, I'm really tr trying to do this now and turn things around so can, she can be proud of me. And to hear more heartwarming stories of recovery from addiction, then make sure to catch our next number four program in this five part There Is Life After Addiction series. Until then, well, I'm going to leave the last word with various contributors to this series, beginning with addiction counsellor Barry Butler. I never give up hope. There's nobody, absolutely nobody, beyond redemption. People make mistakes, some are much bigger than others, but there is still hope there for everybody. There is always hope. And this is sometimes that hope that we show, that is the whole thing that gives the people the belief in themselves. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.